Thanks for tuning in. The following is one of three segments from the August Des Moines, Iowa Salesforce user group. Metazoa was our sponsor and did a fantastic job showcasing their snapshot product, talking with us about the challenges of profiles and permission sets. Eric Dreschfield shared his timely and insightful thoughts around the value of diversity within the workforce. Finally, in the third video, I wrap it up with a quick introduction to record triggered flows and how they compare to Process Builder. I know you're going to enjoy each topic, so let's get started. Those of you who do not know Eric Dreschel, uh, I'm so excited to have him uh, part of our user group today. Uh, Eric is uh, just one of the, the most down to earth, uh, pleasant people to be, at, to be around. I, I met Eric at Dreamforce um knew about him for a long time um obviously he's he's been an mvp for a number for seven years mvp hall, hall of fame i understand as well but i met him um on one of the golden gate bridge tours and that's where i first got to meet him and uh we've we've done that golden gate walk a few times now together and he's just an awesome dude if if um if he's not in your network of friends he should be uh so <laughs> look him up on linkedin uh, wherever, uh, whatever social media you use, he's just, he, he's, I can't say enough good things about him. I just uh, really am, it's an honor to have him here and I hope that uh, um, you enjoy what he has to say today. So Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Fantastic, thanks Terry. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen, okay. I got the correct one shared. You're only seeing a slide and not my cheater notes. <laughs> that is correct. Awesome. I always have to wonder about that sometimes, especially when you deal with two monitors when you're trying to do that. So thanks for, for inviting me out, Terry. Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity to come talk. Um, I, I enjoy speaking to community groups and I do it fairly often. So um, today we're gonna talk about um, how, how you can get more success in your organization by diversifying your workforce. So a little about me that maybe hasn't already been covered. Um, Eric Dreschfield, I'm currently Vice President at IT Equality. The, the term delivery is kind of a loose title um, that we, my job there has kind of morphed over the time that I've been there. Primarily responsible for marketing and customer success. Um, been a Salesforce MVP, as the quiz said, for seven years. Uh, I'm now in the MVP Hall of Fame, which is essentially uh, MVP for life. So that's kind of cool. Um, I'm probably equally as famous for the bacon thing, which I'll explain shortly, as well as Midwest Dreamin', which I started that community-led conference all the way back in 2011. Um, some people think it was the first community-led conference, but it actually was probably the third one out there. Um, Snowforce started about the same point in time and has been going strong ever since. And there was an event called Dreamforce to You Florida that took place in like 2008, 2009, maybe 2010 uh, as well. And those were, as far as I know, the first true community-led events in this ecosystem. Um, you can find me blogging at thedreshonline.com. I don't do a whole lot at the moment, but I'm working on uh, a new blog series that I'm gonna launch soon. So I'll start getting more posts up there pretty, pretty soon. Um, I am the organizer of the annual Dreamforce Newbie Reunion Breakfast which I've always done as a fundraiser for Project Night Nights. I've been doing that since 2012. Uh, if you don't know anything about Project Night Night, they are a nonprofit that helps support homeless kids because kids are victims of homelessness. It's not their fault that they're homeless and sometimes it's not even their parents' fault. Um, so if you get a chance to check them out and, and if you have the desire, please make a donation to that organization. In my several years of supporting them, I've raised about $30,000 for them up to this point. Um, I, I may have a Twitter addiction. There's three of the Twitter handles that I use. Um, probably most often, there's a few more that I tweet from every once in a while as well. And then the quote down there in the lower left of the screen uh, is probably the one thing that I say most often about this ecosystem, that the greatest strength in it is the people and the connections that are shared. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about marketing and sales enablement and sales. And then we're going to define success and talk about privilege, diversity, inclusion, 
and results and, and how all that stuff can sort of tie together. So everybody kind of knows what marketing is, I think, hopefully. Um, if, you're in a mar if you're a marketer, you really understand the goal of marketing is simply get more leads. It, it's their job, it's the marketing department's job, to bring more leads to the organization. Um, Tom, I, I know you're really familiar with that. Um, it, it's accomplished through all sorts of different techniques, social media, blog posts, email, campaigns, um, virtual events such as this one, potentially, uh, in-person events when they used to take place. Uh, for a lot of companies in this organ in this ecosystem, Dreamforce was probably the biggest single event they ever did from a lead get lead generation standpoint. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how how companies kind of survive this year without the prospect of a Dreamforce. And I don't know if anyone saw the news recently. I think it was just yesterday I saw an article that got posted that there may not even be a virtual Dreamforce this year. Uh, there were some hints at that. So who knows? It'll be interesting to see what happens. So that's marketing, uh, get more leads for the organization so the sales people can end up selling more so the organization can make more money. So what's sales enablement? Sales enablement is anything that an organization does, any tools they use that help better the chances of a lead becoming a qualified lead and then ultimately that lead converting over to an opportunity and becoming a, a sale. So how is it that most organizations qualify leads? It seems to me though, as though today, organizations look at things like job title, company size, they may have uh, what some people affectionately call an ICP or an ideal customer profile. Uh, some organizations refer to them as buyer personas, uh, where you look at the traits of an individual, what their job title is, what skills they use, um, whether they're an admin or a developer, for example. Uh, or if they're part of the executive suite or, or things like that. Um, some companies probably even use gender a, as a qualifying lead uh, and we'll touch on that in a little while as well. So, um, so, so far we've said we've defined marketing, we've defined sales enabling. Once you get all those two put together, naturally what's going to happen next is a sale. You're going to have people talking to your company, your, your lead's going to get qualified uh, and you're going to close a deal. Um, the, the hidden words back there that you may not see very well that show up at the beginning, the AIDA is kind of the whole process or the thought, thought behind marketing, if you will. It's you grab someone's attention, you get their interest, um, you build uh, a decision, and then you take action. And of course, that leads to sales where you always want to be closing if you're that sales rep. So what happens when you make a sale? I mean, you know, in, in your Salesforce org, do you have the confetti uh, enabled? So when something goes close one, the, the confetti pops on your screen. Uh, that's great. Um, but what really happens once it's a sale happens? That's the next question. I mean, what, what is success? Is success simply closing the opportunity and getting a sale? Is it winning that deal? Um, you need, there's a lot more to think about than just sales and just winning the deal. Did you, do, did you do it profitably? Is your company gonna make money on this deal? Or did your, your sales rep cut the, the throat out from underneath you and discount it so heavily that there's no chance of you making any money when you actually implement the project for that particular company? Those are all aspects into success. And, and every individual's uh, view of success is something totally different. Um, you know, it, even if you're not in sales, you can certainly have metrics that define your success. Uh, whether you're a marketer, whether you're a Salesforce administrator or, or developer, whatever, there, there are things that you can, can use to define success. And they don't always have to be about money, right? Sorry, Tom, they don't always have to be about money. So let's, let me, let's- Come on now. <laughs> that was directed at Tom Cruise. <laughs> so let's, let's pause for a second and, and quickly think about what we just saw and what I just showed you. Um, we, we talked about marketing, get more leads. We talked about sales enablement, converting those leads into opportunities. And then we talked about sales, closing those opportunities and, and winning the deal. All right, that's everything we've talked about. So, so step out of your comfort zone here for a second and, and take a look at what you see on the screen and, and think about that for a quick second. Does anybody see something in common among these four graphics? 
I'll pause for a quick second. I don't have the chat window up, so I don't know if anybody's pinging in with an answer. Um, I will let you know if I see something. I'm curious if anybody's catching on to what I'm trying to get to. Keep in mind the part of this, this presentation has to do with diversity, inclusion, and equality. That might be a hint. So, okay, well, we'll keep moving. I have an idea. Sure. Else has jumped in. I, I noticed that all of the hands are white. Right. Is that? That's, that's part one. of it, yep. Okay. It, it's not quite as clear probably oh, that it's all male as well. Yep, Jackie just said white men. Yep, exactly. Okay. The, the traditional stereotypical um, technology firm, right? Run by white men. So that could, could imply some privilege there as well. And that's kind of the crux of what we really want to talk about and how that can help your organization. So what's privilege? Um, privilege really is, is simply put, having access to benefits uh, based on the traits that you possess that you have no control over. Um, everyone sitting here in this virtual room has no control over the fact that they were born male or female or other. Uh, they don't have any control over the color of their skin. Um, and, and you know, you, you can't choose your parents uh, and your parents can't choose their children, although some parents may act that way once in a while. Um, but you know, the privilege really has to do with, with how you utilize the things that you are born with for the benefit and, and the, the, the good of others. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into privilege. Um, I found this, this great uh, continuum um, on that TEDx talk that's referenced at the bottom. And it really talks about privilege being a continuum uh, and that everybody fits into this continuum somewhere and in some way, and that we all have privilege in one or more of these categories, but not necessarily in all of them. Um, I mean, for those who may or may not know me, I'm, I'm white, I'm male, I'm able-bodied, um, I'm straight. All of those could be considered traits that would give me privilege in some way. Um, for, for those who may not be too familiar with the company I'm working for at the moment, IT Equality. IT Equality, their, their entire business model is based on, uh, on increasing the diversity in technology, uh, bringing people out of, out of situations that were troubled or that gave them less access to technology. Uh, a lot of the consultants that we have on staff right now came to IT Equality from jobs at coffee shops or fast food restaurants or pet food centers. Um, and we trained them on Salesforce. We gave them the skills they need to be a successful consultant. Um, I'm the only straight white male at this company out of the 16 or so people that are there. Everyone else is uh, a person of color, a female, a, a gender binary, non-binary individual um, and, and things like that. So the, the, the whole basic premise of IT equality is pushing equality in the IT industry. And so the, the big point here is um, don't judge people Hi, by how they, look and how they behave um, and make sure that if you, if you realize that you have privileges that you should be, should be using those for the good of other people. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of that late, lately uh, with Black Lives Matter. Um, I mean, most of us probably realize that 200 years ago, slavery still existed in the US um, and it's taken 200 plus years to get past that. And in a lot of cases, we're still not really past it because of the, 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 yeah, the systemic racism that's going on in this country. And that's been evidenced by some of the things that we've recently seen. So if you, if you realize you have privilege, try to use it to benefit other people. So what's, what's diversity? Um, it, it's everybody really, I mean, Pretty straightforward. It goes hand in hand with, pri with privilege. If you're striving to have a diverse organization, you need to kind of think about it like a bingo card. Uh, Mary Scotton from Salesforce introduced me to this, this process that she called diversify your feed, where she developed a bingo card where each square on the bingo card was a different category of individual. And your goal when you went to Dreamforce where she introduced this was meet somebody not like you and check off every single box on that bingo card and make sure that you, that you are meeting a diverse group of people. For, for Midwest Dreamin, the conference that I run, um, the first couple of years that we did Midwest Dreamin, when we were selecting our con content for that commit for the conference, um, 
we looked at who submitted the conference, who submitted sessions. We looked at their qualifications. We looked at whether they were an MVP or, or not. And we made some of our decisions based upon those qualities. And we got some negative feedback on a few occasions that some of the speakers didn't seem as well prepared. Their content wasn't as thought out. And Mary actually suggested to us as an organizing con team that we should select our sessions blindly. So from 2015 going forward, the, the people who vote on the content at Midwest Dreaming, all they see is the title and the description of the session. They don't have a clue who's presenting, whether they're a first time speaker or they've spoken for 25 years. They don't, they don't know any of that stuff. Uh, and what we discovered through that, that blind process is we found, we, we found our sessions were better attended, uh, more highly rated, and we had a much more diverse group of people presenting those sessions. We went from about 10% minority presenters to almost 60%. Uh, within that one year time period from that turnaround. So diversity is, is super important, uh, not just in business, but in conferences and things like that. Um, I mean, there's been a study that McKinsey and Company did back in 2018 that determined that companies that are in the top 25% for cultural and ethnic diversity on their executive teams were 33% more likely to have industry lead, leading profitability. And that also those uh, that diversity includes LGBTQ. It includes age and generational, as well as international and ethnic diversities. That same study also found that the companies in the bottom 25% for diversity were almost 30% more likely to achieve less than average profitability, uh, falling way behind. So, in other words, if you're not uh, if you're not a diverse organization not only are you not really keeping up, you're actually falling behind. So obviously it's very important, uh, not just from human nature, but it helps businesses perform better as well. So the, the, third, uh, the third term that most people will hear about when we're talking about diversity uh, is, is inclusion. I think the second one would have been equality, which I probably skipped, um, but inclusion is also, is also really talked about here. And what that really is, is um, making sure that everyone or everything is part of a group or a structure. Um, think about a time that you experienced when you were, were being included. Uh, you were part of a conversation that felt really good, you got invited to an awesome event uh, that, that you really enjoyed, and, and it felt good, it felt safe, it felt comfortable. Uh, everybody should have the opportunity to, to have those same feelings at work, uh, at conferences, when they're out in public, um, and things like that. So, you know, um, the, the way to think about it is, you know, um, what's in it? I mean, I know there's, there's probably people out in the audience realizing this is, this is true. They hear this all the time from Salesforce. And then there may be some of you thinking, that's all cool, it's all great, but what's in it for me? Or, or perhaps you're thinking, what's it gonna cost me or cost my company? And that's when the reality of this whole diversity and inclusion aspect hits. Um, it, there's, there's not necessarily a cost per se for being diverse and inclusive uh, as an organization. The, the way I prefer to think of it is it's more of an investment that you're making in the future success of your organization. And it's really only a cost when you're not actively seeking out diverse and inclusive ideas and methodologies. So as, as a, the results kind of speak for themselves, the bottom line is a diverse workforce drives economic growth. Um, if you're recruiting for candidates, uh, if, if you have a diverse pool of candidates, you're gonna get a wider range of thought. You're gonna get more, more qualified individuals. Um, you're going to discover the benefits of that diversity uh, from, because everyone comes to the table with their own unique background based upon how they were raised and what they, the challenges that they faced when they were growing up and things like that. And all of that builds character and builds, builds things that can help organizations. And one of the other things that um, the, the uh, Center for American Progress discovered in some of their research was that diverse and inclusive work for, workforces generally have lower employee turnover and uh, hence lower costs on turnover. And that's a, that's a huge expense at companies is, is the turnover of employees. You have to hire new employees, you have to train them uh, and all that. And that takes time and takes money. 
and anything you can do to, to reduce turnover is gonna be a good thing. So the bottom line, diversity fosters a more creative and more innovative workforce. So from, from where you're now sitting, you're thinking, well, what can I do? How can I as an individual make this happen or help drive this at my own organization? You, you gotta start by looking at yourself, of course. You have to be aware of your own biases and, and make sure you interrupt them. Um, for me personally, that's been a little bit of a challenge where I'm working right now. Um, the founder of IT Equality is a non-binary individual and prefers the pronouns they and them. And for, for whatever reason, my mind just has a hard time grasping that sometimes and I often refer to Ashley as she or her. Fortunately, I have coworkers that point that out to me, which is helping me get over my own, my own uh, unconscious bias and, and learn from that experience. And one of the things that I've also found that helps uh, helps you, you grow as an individual is to mentor someone, but not someone who looks like you. Uh, find, find individuals who are different from you on that privilege continuum that we looked at and offer to help them learn. Talk to them about Salesforce, you know, do the things you already know how to do, um, but find an individual who's, who's a little different than you that, that's looking for some help with that. Um, I mentioned the, the diversify your feed. There's a, there's a, an episode of the Salesforce admins podcast from back in 2014 um, that talks about that. Um, I think the, that's a link on the screen there that when I share this with Terry, uh, you'll be able to, to access that to go directly to there. A um, couple other things to, to, to potentially do, you know, speak up when you see something going wrong, when you see someone acting in a non-diverse way. Uh, one of the things that, that I know a lot of us are probably guilty of is using the word guys when we're speaking to a crowd. Hey guys, let me tell you about something. And, and half the room may not be male. I mean, gene generically speaking, guys is a, is a, a term indicating male gender. Uh, so you, you may inadvertently be offending people when you use that term uh, when it's not just a male audience. And even when it is a male audience, there may be some people who don't like that. So think about that, um, kind of keep in mind your, your language and your actions while you're, you're trying to help other people grow. Um, and that's really all I have. Um, I'm open to take questions. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you, if you want, uh, if you have questions later, if you want a conversation later on as well. Thank you, Eric. I really do appreciate it. Um, this is uh, a topic that um, that a friend of mine, uh, uh, me and a friend <laughs> had over lunch one day, because uh, I've, I've for, and I can only speak for me, I grew up uh, in a rural area of Iowa and grew up with all white kids. And it was, um, I, I, in my head, I want, and, and in the words that I say, I want to, um, I want to come across as, uh, colorblind and I, I don't believe I have a um, on purpose uh, bias toward any anyone or a racist undertone to any of it but given given all the things that have happened in the world it it has caused me to want to just reevaluate myself is it just words that I'm saying that that I and Joseph and I had this conversation yesterday as we were preparing for me I want to love all people regardless you yeah. know, and, and, and I want to love them equally, regardless. And yeah. it's easy, easy to say the words, but when you stop and think and, and say, are my actions also living up to those words? It, it causes me, I guess, to, you know, what can we do <laughs> part of your presentation? Right. That's, that's what has caused me to stop and think, you know, am I really, do I really, am I, is, are my actions in line with what I, believe about myself. Um, yeah, yep. I, and I was probably raised in a very similar environment to you were, to the one that you were. I was raised in suburban yeah. Cleveland, Ohio, in, a, in an upper middle class, probably 95% white community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but all of the, the, the things that I've learned over the years, and probably especially since I got into the Salesforce ecosystem, where Salesforce has always been pushing diversity and equality, was it, it, it's hitting a lot more close to home for me personally because of, of individuals within my own family. 
Uh, one of my daughters is a lesbian. She's been with her partner now for seven years. Um, her partner has recently started transitioning from female to male. Um, so I, I have the whole, the whole LGBT community in my family. Uh, and I love those kids dearly. Um, it doesn't matter to me how, how they are, what they believe, what, what makes them happy as long as they're happy. Um, probably 15 years ago, my daughter posted something, maybe not 15, has Facebook been around 15 years ago? Yeah, um, she is. posted something on Facebook once that, that was celebrating the one year anniversary of her coming out of the closet. Oh, and, and my reaction to that post was to send her a text message that said, Cindy, my wife and I, we've always wondered um, whether you were, were a lesbian or not, but we were scared to ask you for fear that it might offend you, regardless of whether you were or whether you were not. Yeah. And I continued in this text message to my daughter and I simply said, you're my daughter, I love you, I want you to be happy, and as long as you're not an ax murderer, I don't have any problems with what you're doing. Yeah. And the response I got back from Allison was, thanks dad, I love you too, and I don't even own an ax. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah. it, it hits personally. I mean, even, even the, the racial issues hit very personal to me right now. My, my oldest granddaughter is dating a black man. He's the sweetest man in the world. He's extremely polite. Uh, it, it's always, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, please and thank you. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. This kid is so, yeah. so kind. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Um, but when my, my granddaughter and, and Deshaun go out on dates together, uh, we, we're scared for them, for the reaction that the community might give them just because they're an interracial couple. Uh, yeah. And so I, I take all of this stuff very personally. For me, it's a little bit more than just words and act and actions it all hits right. for me yeah I, I my my wife is uh, half chinese half mexican and i i remember uh, people questioning that and in fact we had one we had one person say uh, uh, talking to me say terry you can do better than that and i thought oh how yeah. how incredibly um disappointing yeah <laughs> that's a nice nice way of that saying hurts. it um, yeah. But yeah, you know, um, so yeah, I'm in a, a I, I don't even, I, don't, I guess I don't even think about the fact that, you know, what, what her nationality and background is. I, it's, she's who I fell in love with. So that's, yeah. um, but I think this is a, this is a, a great topic, especially given our, our current time. I do have a, a question though, because um, I'm going to forget exactly how to say it. Um, there are, there are, how do you deal with a situation of, yes, I want to love it, all people regardless, but I, I don't necessarily agree with their stance or how they are, what they are doing. How do you deal with reconciling the fact that I want to treat you exactly the same as I would treat everybody else, but I don't necessarily agree with all of your choices what yeah. how do you how do you deal with that? that that that's a that's a tough one for sure i mean and <laughs> and, and the, the way i'm going to answer that is probably with the, the parent analogy okay. where where you may not like your kids behaviors and you may not love what your kids are doing but you still love your kids yeah i mean and, and that's that's the classic and the, the clear-cut example of unconditional love right. uh, i mean i and I, I i totally understand your question i mean and and, and feel the same way about certain things, like, like the whole racial issues that are going on right now. Yeah. Why do people break into stores and loot and damage things that aren't theirs that have nothing to do with the racial issues? Right. I mean, that, that I don't understand, but you can certainly understand why they're frustrated and why they're angry and why they're upset because of the situation that happened recently and things that are going on. So it, it's yeah. a tough one. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I don't know if I have a great answer for you there. But you just... <laughs> that, 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 your, your analogy is the exact answer that I've come to as well is, is from the standpoint of loving my kids regardless yeah. uh, of, of, uh, of what they that? choose. Yeah, go ahead. Um, with Because I hear a lot of uh, people using the example of people looting and so forth, and that's kind of a generalization. So when you're looking at you know, television and you're seeing people, you know, doing these, beha these behaviors. Um, I tend to look at the individuals who are doing them rather than to generalize and, and lump them into a group because, right. you know, when you think about it, there are multiple races that are doing these things and multiple um, 
uh, people from different economic backgrounds who are also doing these things. So I think maybe it would be helpful just to look at them on an individual basis rather than grouping them into one kind of, you know, one group of people or another. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I, uh, I really get frustrated with when we categorize people into buckets because we, we're, we're not, we're not buckets, we're individual people, like you said, and I, I, I appreciate that. That's a very good thought. Yeah, the, 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 the wording that a lot of people probably use right now because of the whole pandemic is we're in the, we're all in this together. Um, and to me, you know, if, if you think about everyone as just being human and treat everyone as, as a human being, we are all in this together and that's all that really matters is everybody's human and everybody deserves the same chance and at, at a good life and, and things like that. So. Very good. All right. I was just going to say, if I could just add something really quick, I, I, I see um, people just, I, my, I have a perception that I see that I, it feels like people lack empathy and putting themselves in another person's position and remembering how you would want to be treated is how you should treat other people. So that's just my, my personal feeling. Good thought. All right, one last uh, chance. Oh, hey, Eric, I, I have a question. So it, you mentioned some, some great guidance on, you know, the, like the individual level and things that can be done today. But as our, our companies and organizations are having these difficult conversations on a larger scale and trying to understand how to do this, uh, you, you know, from a business standpoint, whether it's, you know, looking at, uh, you know, who our, who our customers are, for instance, or what our culture is like internally. Do you have any, any guidance or resources on, um, how, on how our organizations and companies can uh, have those conversations? I, I feel like there's a lot of, um, a lot of just exploring and how to have those. So do you have any guidance there? I, Eric, I think you're on Yeah, mute. sorry. I, I caught your little, your little uh, <laughs> motioning there. Yeah, the, there, there, there is a list of resources that I've got compiled somewhere that I will share with Terry. Uh, so he can share it with the group as well that, that some of its books, some of its articles that, that talk about all those types of things and, and ways that you, you can help your organization perhaps uh, understand why there's good in doing that. Uh, um, and, and I mean, even just from the individual perspective, um, there's, there's things that everybody can learn from some of these resources. So I'll, I'll be sure to share that with Terry also. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, very good. Um, I will put the, that information out on our community page so you'll be able to find it there. Um, in our user group community. Uh, all right, well, Eric, thank you so much. I know that th this was, a, I think, a very timely conversation. It's not necessarily an easy conversation, um, but it's, I, it is an important conversation. And so I appreciate uh, uh, you sharing your insight and uh, thank you so much for being a part of the, the group here today. Thanks for having me.